Hey, I want to start our time today with a uh, little quiz. I guess I call it a quiz for some. I, I call it a history lesson for others. Um, you know that saying that everything that is old is new again? You've heard that? Well, what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you something that's really, really, really old. Okay? But before I show you this, I'm going to ask you, um, for those that will remember, I'm going to ask you if you can finish this sentence or finish this quote for me. Okay? Ready? Again, history lesson for some, quiz for others. Here we go. Ready? Yep. There's no need to fear. Ooh. <laughs> Only one person. Only one person. There's no need to fear. Underdog is here. Uh-huh, yeah. Only one. I'm not even going to point him out. I, 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 oh. Underdog. Y'all remember Underdog? Yeah. Underdog, there he is. There he is, the unsuspecting, lovable hero. I don't know if you remember him, but but man, Underdog, he had this little ring on that had a U on it. And let me tell you, he would pop that case open, he would pop that pill, and he went from zero to hero just like that. Now, I tell you, now that I'm older and I'm not a kid anymore, I want to know what was in that pill. <laughs> I don't know if he is like some kind of super steroid or something. I want to check his pill and I want to check out Popeye's spinach because I've tr that, that is not regular spinach. I'm going to let you know that now. I don't know about you, I tried eating spinach all the time, but my muscles stayed the same. And I was like, when is this going to work? Anyway. So... The term underdog, the term underdog is, uh, is not just limited to an old cartoon, right? right? It's also a term or it's also a label or a way to imply that someone is at a disadvantage or that someone is about to lose. When you say, hey, that's the underdog, that means that that person, they got a great disadvantage or they're getting ready to lose. <laughs> so the word underdog, I started studying and I said, well, where does this word come from, underdog? So it goes back, actually, to the 1800s when they would actually have dog fights. And the dog that would lose would be the underdog. You ever heard that expression, oh, there's the top dog? Yeah. Well, that's where that expression comes from, too. The winner was deemed the top dog. So, again, we see this terminology in our systems in our life and, and you watching any athletic competitions you've been hearing it oh there's the underdog there's the underdog but here's the issue the issue is this is that when the term underdog or how does the term underdog become a problem it simply becomes a problem when this happens when in reality and this could be many of us in this room the problem happens when underdog no longer becomes a label, but it becomes an identity. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes. It is that when it moves from just being something that you're called to, to being something that you identify with, then it becomes a problem. See, in other words, when you develop the mentality that, you know what, <sighs> there's no way I'm going to win. There's no way I'm going to get out of this. Well, if you develop this mentality, oh, I'm at such a disadvantage because of this and because of that, because of where I was born. <laughs> when you start thinking like that, you are developing an underdog identity. Always expecting to lose. Always expecting defeat. Always at a disadvantage. 
Can I be honest with you this morning? Yes, not like I'm not other mornings, but. <laughs> if you have paid any attention to the media, if you paid any attention to just culture and culture in general, the word identity has become a buzzword. Hmm. What do you mean? Well, according to the culture, according to the media, identity can mean just about anything anybody wants it to be. Society will tell you, well, identity is fluid. Today, I'm going to identify as a Yamaha MX-88. <laughs> Right. Don't call me pastor, call me Yamaha MX-88 from now on. Okay, Yamaha. Right? And if you don't respect my identity, then there's a whole other set of issues, right? Right, right. But what we really fail to see in all of this is, if you don't recognize it, that our identity is constantly being attacked. Yeah. Right. yeah. See, when, when people come out and say, oh, you know, uh, uh, I'm not a person, I'm, I'm actually like a fuzzy cat. <laughs> meow, meow. <laughs> when, I, when I come out with all of that, <laughs> what that is, again, is our identity under attack. More specifically, the devil is trying to assault your identity. He's trying to assault your identity. Hmm. Now, here's the thing. When we develop this mentality that, you know what, we are going to lose. When we develop this mentality, I'm always expecting a defeat. When we develop this, men this, men this mentality of Murphy's Law, I don't know who Murphy is. I don't know how he created his law. Oh, but if it's going to go wrong, is it? Okay, oh, Mur I don't Murphy, please. <laughs> when we develop that mentality, right? right? That, again, is the devil's assault working on our identity. Yeah. I would submit to you today that instead of trying to find identity in culture, in politics, in relationships, that we would find it in Christ. Yes. Yes. If we find our identity in Christ, and we under, if we really truly pursue the true definition of identity, we'll see this. That identity, if we really want to know what identity means, if we want to know what identity is really all about, identity is simply this. Identity is the essence of who we are as defined by God. Uh -huh. my God. That's our identity. The essence of who we are as defined by God. Not social media. Right? Not this book or that. No, no. It's our identity is the essence of who we are, again, as defined by God. So as people or as children of God, our identity, our value, our purpose should really be a direct, a direct reflection of God like we talked about earlier. Yeah. A direct reflection of God's character. Yeah. A direct reflection of his glory. So, uh, I want to continue as we've been doing over the last few weeks. I want to continue to look at the life of David. And as we go and return back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, in verses 32 through 37 today, we're going to learn from David a few truths that will help us strengthen our identity as someone who is a reflection of God uh, with his character. And again, not just having this underdog expected to be defeated mentality. Amen? Amen. All right. So 
If you remember, if you've been with us over the last few weeks, when we jump into 1 Samuel 17, I'm not going to go over everything, but basically the bottom line when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 17 is that David had, David's basically making a snack run. You remember that his dad said, hey, take this cheese, take this bread up to your brothers. David is delivering cheese sandwiches up to the battlefield. Hey, he's a DoorDash. That's right. He, he, he's DoorDash. So he gets up there and he discovers this entire Israel, uh, the army of Israel who has been petrified, who has been paralyzed for 40 days. For 40 days, they have been fearful. They haven't been able to do anything except shake in their boots over the last 40 days. Now, we didn't talk too much about this before. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting too loud. <laughs> oh, we don't mind. <laughs> we didn't talk too much about this before. But I need to tell you. Israel, this army that, that, that's been paralyzed for 40 days, this army that, that, that's scared of their own shadow, can I just give you a little bit of background on who this army is? Yes. See, we didn't mention this, but Israel is not just some normal, ordinary army. These guys, these guys who have been shaking for 40 days, these guys, they had the entire region, the entire area on lockdown. These guys, back in, 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 in chapter 14, there's a list of everybody they had whooped. Okay? If you were some kind of Ike, Jebusite, Amorite, if, you're, if you ended with an Ike, they had whooped you. <laughs> they had defeated you. The Amalekites, if you, they, you name it, they had beat you before. The Bible even goes on so far as to say this. They were so, they were such bad dudes. The Bible says this about Saul. The Bible literally says that whatever direction he turned in, he was going to be victorious. North, south, east, west, it didn't matter. Saul says we're doing that. Victory. Okay? So it's this same army that all of a sudden is like... <sighs> <laughs> Same army. Now, what happened? What changed all of that? How did they go from world beaters to, well, sin? Sin came in. So because of sin, now fear comes along with it. And right behind that fear comes a loudmouth giant standing out on the battlefield for 40 days saying, uh, what up? So, and the reason that they were so afraid is because in large part, they had forgotten who they were. So here's my first point of the day, and it's simply this. When you stay close to God, you don't forget who you are. When you're close to God, you don't forget who you are. Well, let's look at that. Let's see. So here's David in 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning at verse 32. Look at what David says. Now, everybody's freaking out. Nobody wants to fight uh, uh, the giant. Nobody wants to confront him. And here's David. David says this. Don't worry about this Philistine. David told Saul, I'll go fight him. Uh, don't be ridiculous. Saul replied, <laughs> there is no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. <laughs> Are you kidding? Listen, in case you missed it, you are only a boy. He's been a man of war since he was your age. Okay, listen, he's three times older than you. 
That means he's been warned a whole lot longer than you even been around. <laughs> Thank you, Saul. Appreciate your encouragement. <laughs> Thank you for your belief, Saul. <laughs> Saul's not going to win any cheerleader of the year awards, is he? <laughs> but here's the thing. Saul makes the same mistake that all of us have made. All of us are making or all of us may even make. Saul makes the same mistake that we make about others and sometimes we even make that same mistake about ourselves. What is that mistake? What does Saul do? Saul looks at the outside and not the heart. Saul looks at, Saul looks, I'm sorry, Saul. Am I saying Saul? Saul. Saul looks at the outside and not the heart. I don't know if you got, and again, I'm not getting, we talked about this on Wednesday. I'm not going to go over whether or not you're watching the Olympics and we talked about all this. But if you are, or if you've heard about this, I want to show you a picture of this guy from Turkey. Now, this guy is at the Olympic Games. He's shooting. Okay? Now, everybody else in this competition, they show up. Put that other picture up. They show up. They got ear protection on. They got these glasses that flip and spin and, you know, it can like all this stuff changing and all of this in their own. My man from Turkey just shows up in his regular glasses. Now, looking on the outside, this dude, he's got all the gear. Man, look at him. Oh, yeah, the form. My man here looks like he just rolled up. <laughs> oh, like, we, we got a competition today? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, dang, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll go out here and win this thing. Right? Dude won the silver medal. Yeah. Just chilling like hand in pocket. Okay? Again, looking on the outside, there's no way. The Bible says this, 1 Samuel chapter 16. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his height or appearance, for I have rejected him. He's talking about Saul, big, good-looking Saul, big, taller than everybody else Saul. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You see, what happens is by Saul saying, hey, there's no way that you can do this. By Saul saying, man, don't you understand what you're going up against? What Saul is doing is Saul is immediately attacking and disrespecting David's identity based on what he sees. David, you are an underdog, bro. David, you have no chance of winning. Don't you, based on what I see, but not based on what God sees. How, how many of us have been guilty of pulling a saw once or twice? Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With somebody else, yeah, yeah. Even with ourselves, right? We, we, we look and limit ourselves, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, because David, again, was close to God, David did not forget who he was, right? Now, you say, what does that mean? Well, well, let me show you how David knew his identity, okay? Now, this is something I, I think is not, I, I've never heard this talked about in church before, so I've never heard it growing up, but I think it's such an important part to the narrative. It's such an important part of the story of this whole David-Goliath narrative. Narrative. So what happens is this, is after Saul sins, he begins losing his mind in essence. He begins having these attacks and these fits and, and the only thing that can help him is, this, is if he hears the music of a harp. And so they start looking, well, hey, let's look far and wide and let's find someone who can play the harp to calm King Saul down. 
And so the very first introduction, now keep in mind the very what? First, first introduction that Saul gets of David is this that we're getting ready to read. Watch this. Here it says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 18. They're looking for a guy that can play the harp. One of the servants says to Saul, I know it's not my hair. <laughs> All right. <laughs> One of the servants says to Saul, One of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Check. Not only that, but he's also a brave warrior. He's a man of war and he has good judgment. Not only that, but he's a good looking dude too. And the Lord is with him. That's the very first impression that Saul gets of David. See, even before David was even thinking about stepping on to face a Goliath, David was already called brave. He was already called a man of war. He was already called a man of good judgment. He was already established in identity by God with all of these things. In other words, David knew his identity even if Saul forgot. <laughs> Can I tell you that God will plant the seeds of identity in your life long before they even start to grow? Do you know that? I was talking to a friend of mine from junior high school. And we were catching up, and, and he was saying, you know, hey, how's it going? I'm like, hey, you know, man, I'm pastoring out in Vegas, and blah, blah, blah. And we were just catching up, and I'm like, dude, can you believe I actually, like, ended up being a pastor? <laughs> and you know what he told me? He said, man, I remember just like it was yesterday. We were sitting there in science class, and you were, and you were preaching. <laughs> what? In science class? What? Oh, yeah, man, we always remember at lunch you would always do this and you would always do that. No, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> but my point is, even then, there were seeds of identity that were planted that were growing, and I didn't even know it. Right, right. Wow, that's cool. So, again, when you stay close to God, you don't forget who you are, even though everyone else will. Right. <laughs> My Bible even tells me that in his own hometown, they just looked at Jesus, oh, you're just a carpenter. Right? <laughs> right? That's right. All right, next verse. But David persisted. I love that word. He persisted. Look, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. Now, <laughs> when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, oh, I go after it. I'm the beast. I go after it with a club and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. And God forbid, if that animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I beat it to death. Let that animal turn itself on me and see what he gets. <laughs> now, again, when you're close to God, you don't forget who you are. But when you stay close to God, you don't forget what he has done. When you stay close to God, you don't forget what he has done. See, what David is describing, by David describing, hey, I went out and I grabbed the thing by the jaw and I beat it and I did. When, what David is describing is he's talking about some facts that occurred when no one else was around. Right. He's talking about how he practiced in private. Watch this. He had lots of private preparation before public proclamation. He had lots of practice by himself. A lot of lions, 
a lot of bears, a lot of, he, he, he had a lot of hides laying around. See, David's private battles of fighting lions and bears and tending his sheep, all of that was critical in shaping his identity. All of that was critical in him allowing, uh, uh, just, just trusting God in his deliverance on a whole new way. See, these private moments, what all of these things, did, these didn't occur in the public spotlight. No, no. These happened in private. They were forming again his character, his faith. These weren't just random things that happened. No, 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 no. This was the exclusive lion slash bear training program. Right? Yeah, yeah. See, these were divine preparations for the even bigger challenges that laid ahead. See, the lions, in other words, what I'm trying to say is the lions and the bears prepared David for Goliath. So my statement to you today is simply this, is that the lions and the bears that you're facing today are preparing you for something much, much bigger. See, I need to just say it like this. For some of us, your struggle yesterday made it possible for you to succeed today. Yeah, Carol, I'm talking to you. Uh-huh. Your struggle yesterday made it possible for you to succeed today. Right. Uh, another way of looking at it is this, is that today's stress is preparing you for tomorrow's success. Yeah? yeah? Say it with me. Today's stress, Today's stress is preparing you preparing for tomorrow's success. tomorrow's success. All right. So I'm going to close with this. Here we go. Last two verses. Verses 30, 36 and 37. <laughs> David says this. Watch what he says. He says that I have done this to both the lions and the bears. <laughs> and I'm going to do it to this pagan Philistine too. Because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear, he will, say will, will. rescue me from this Philistine. <laughs> so Saul <laughs> finally consents. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> and may the Lord be with you because you're going to need all the help you can get. <laughs> all right. So here we go. When you're close to the Lord, you don't forget who you are. Say, don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are. When you stay close to the Lord, you don't forget what he has done. Say, what he has done. What he has done. Here's the last one. When you stay close to the Lord, you won't forget what he will do. See, here's David. And David's mentality is basically this. David's mentality, his identity is this. It's happened once, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. Can I just, everybody in this room right now, You've got a it happened once story with God. You wouldn't be here if it hadn't. He did something at least once because you're here now. Now, David again, he says it happened once and it's going to happen again. Out of this whole narrative, this whole story, out of everything that we see, out of this whole text, there is literally only one person on this entire battlefield that believed David even had a chance, and his name was David. Now, I want to ask you something. In the Bible, in Scripture, we all know that God has all sorts of names, right? Yeah. All sorts of names that describe his character, that describe his nature, his ability all throughout the word, right? We know Jehovah Jireh. We know uh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom. We know that there are all of these names 
that describe the nature and the character of God. Amen? Yep. So here's my question for you as we close. And you can go ahead and come on up, Jewel. I'll make me, make me stop. <laughs> my question for you is this. Based on your experience, based on what you've seen, based on the identity that God has established in you, if you could add one more name or describer of God to the Bible, what would it be? What would it be? Think about that for a second. If you could add another descriptor of God, what would it be? Right? For some said, well, see, he's already been my Rafa. He's already healed me. Yeah, but well, what else would you call him? Right? Can I just tell you that if I could add one more name to describe God, I would call him simply this. I would call him the God who already. Ooh, that's cool. Wow, I like that. I like that. The God who already. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. That's so cool. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, what I'm saying is simply this. See, I, I would say the God who already did is the God that will. The, the, the God who already did is the God that will. In other words, the God that already forgave me will forgive me again. <laughs> the God who already provided for me will provide for me again. The God who already delivered me will deliver me again. The God who already uh, uh, loved me will love me again. The God who already healed me will heal me again. The God all ready. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Huh. He already did it. He already did it. Yeah. Huh. Wow. He already did it. So that means he'll do it again. Yeah. You say, well, well, I'm still struck. I haven't got my healing. He already overcame the cross. <laughs> he did it already. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, your healing's on the way. Yeah, yeah. Church, let me encourage you today. You are not an underdog. You're not defeated. You're not a loser. <laughs> Murphy's Law doesn't rule your life. Stop believing the assault of the devil. Stay close to God. Don't forget who you are. Stay close to God. Don't forget what he's done. Stay close to God and you will not forget what he will do. I just want to close with this. Romans 8.37 says it like this. If you're thinking you're an underdog, if you're thinking you can't get over it, no, no. It says this. It says, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through Jesus, through him who loved us. You see, what happens is this, is that even with Jesus, <laughs> death thought, oh, I got you this time. Got you. Jesus, there is no way you're escaping this. Got you nailed up, put you in the ground, Push the rock, you are done. Hmm. You're defeated. You're at a disadvantage. Jesus chilled out for about three days and said, you know, underdog isn't for me. I'm gonna be top dog. <laughs> I'm top dog. <laughs> Here in just a moment, we are getting ready to celebrate communion together. But before we do, I want to take just a moment and maybe there's someone here that you have looked for your identity in so many places. You've looked for your identity in the nightclub. You've looked for your identity 
fill in the blank. You've, you've looked in your identity for social media. You've looked all these different places for your identity and relationship after relationship after abusive relationship. You've kept looking for identity in all the wrong places other than at the cross of Christ. We want to give you that opportunity to find and begin a relationship with Christ. What I want to do is just pray a prayer along with you. And, and again, this isn't the be all end all. No, this prayer is just the beginning of a series of steps of obedience in the right direction toward him. So just real brief. Maybe that's you. Maybe that we've we've said something today and it just resonates with your spirit. And say, so, you know what? I've got to find my identity in Christ and nowhere else. Here in just a second, matter of fact, we'll just do it right now. Let's just pray this prayer together, everyone. Um, um, and maybe yeah, the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and you'll just pray with more sincerity. But let's just pray this. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you, Father, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for, for, for taking the cross for me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling me. Thank you for forgiving me. I believe, Jesus, you died, you rose, you live, and now I live for you. I accept you as Lord, as Savior, as King. And I find my identity only in you. Thank you for my new life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.